Nelly made me cry in the FA Cup final. Oh, I don't, man. This is the time for all of us. I still still dread about that now. Yeah, yeah. It's crazy. You look back at it and you just think you're just 13 minutes from winning the FA Cup final. Oh. It's crazy, man. It's hard It's hard to take, but it is what it is. So I'm here with one of my favourite footballers ever, Jason Punchin. Thanks for joining me. How are you? I'm good, thank you, my friend. Nice to see you. Nice to speak to you in these difficult times. It's funny that we're doing FaceTime instead of we're like face-to-face sitting with microphones and video cameras all around. Yeah, so strange. It's, it's good to chat to you as well. I like, always had a good time at the training ground. Do you remember the first time we ever met? And I called you, was that when I called you Danny? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Swim. So I just started working at Palace. It was my first day. The whole squad are there doing a signing and I walked in, it was silent. You went... Danny, and then everyone just creeping up at me as either I was going to survive or not, basically, from that point on. <laughs> yeah, Palace is definitely one of those places when I was there, it's all about the banter, you know, and if you can have the banter, you survive there, no problem. You know, it's a, it's a brilliant football club. And they're, they're little things, like you just said, it's just testing. It's all it is, is banter. We're all friendly, we're all friends, and, you know, don't sort of let those things bother you. It's definitely a, a massive... Uh... Like a character test, like those things make football, don't they? They make good teams. Definitely, I think they make good teams on and off the pitch. You know, like like, like you said, the backroom staff to be able to have banter with the players, the players be able to have the liability to have banter with them, and the players are not thinking, oh, the staff stepping out of line and stuff like that. You want to have that bit of freedom, and I think that's what we created at Palace. What we had, we had that bit of freedom of having banter with the staff and the players, and that was good. And that goes on to the pitch because everyone's striving at the same goal on and off the pitch. I'm chatting to you, you're in Cyprus, so how, how are things? Yeah, it's, it's good, you know. Um, off the pitch has been brilliant for me and my family since I've been here. My kids are settled, my missus is settled, you know, so it's, it's good. Obviously, now it's a bit of a difficult time um, with everything that's going on, but we're together, staying safe. Um, on the pitch has been probably difficult for the, the Pathos Football Club. We spent a lot of money, the owners. Very good guys, they are. They spent a lot of money to sort of get a lot of players in. We sort of in the summer got about 18 new players. Obviously, you know that back is here with me. Danny Williams come. Um, a boy called Valineros. He's from Greece. Very good player. Um, and then we sort of had a slow start. You know, it was difficult. And then we changed manager around December. Cameron Toshak. He's obviously got great experience at Swansea under 23s. He's come in and done brilliant. You know, the team went on a great run to sort of get their self. Just one point it was they needed to, to finish in the top six. And you finish in the top six here, you're possibly going into Europa places. So we're looking on the, the up, and then obviously this happens, which slows us down a bit. So like you're saying, so Champions League and Europa League is an option for you? Yeah, well, this season we won't. Obviously, we don't know what's gonna, how the season's going to pan out, whether we're going to play or not. But you know, from the start of the season in Cyprus, if you finish one to four places, first is Champions League, second is Europa League. Third and fourth is obviously Europa League. They're all qualifiers, don't get me wrong, but it's a chance that some people may never have in their career to do. I think the team we have is capable of me seeing the league now, all the teams we played. It was just about us gelling as a team, as a football club. And that sort of came together for us. And it's obviously, this has now come at a difficult time for us of what we was building, but we now look forward to next season. In terms of what are, what is like the standard? What are the good teams like for people that don't know? What? Um, the standard is... For me, it's difficult because you play somebody like a, uh, you play someone like a North Aces, right? They're top of the league. They're a very strong, physical team. They're all men, you know, but they don't have the quality that Ajax Larnaca has. Ajax larnaca has got a lot of Spanish players and I would say they could fit in the championship. But then just on being men and characters, the North Aces could probably fit in the championship. But then you play other teams that are probably like a League One team. You know, so it's difficult to judge in that because there is a gap between obviously the top teams and bottom teams, like any league, you know. But ultimately, was I surprised by the league? Yeah, I was, to be honest. You know, I'm not going to say we're sitting there saying it's a top, top league, but I was surprised it was better than I thought it was going to be. You know, you've got some good teams, good managers, good characters, you know, and I, I quite like it. The North is the team for me that I like the most, just being obviously playing in England, um, how they carry themselves like men. I, I quite like them, you know. Ajax. Um, is the other team that I quite like in just the way they play football. 
And in terms of like talking about your career and stuff, like I remember chatting to you before, like I don't think people realise how long you've been around football and how young you started. Your first club was the crazy gang, wasn't it? Yeah, it was the crazy gang. Actually, this weird, I made my debut at 17 for Wimbledon against Walsall, which was Wimbledon. So we still had the crazy gang on the shirt. And then that was in March. And then six months later, I was making my debut at MK Dons. <laughs> so it was it was it was it was a testing time. It was a great learning curve. It's obviously you're not many teams going to administration. It's the only club I've ever been at in administration to see that sort of stuff go on. And if I'm honest, if it probably weren't for that chance, a lot of the young players at the time at Wimbledon wouldn't have got the chance they got. They had to play the, the youth and the kids, and I think that worked well for us. What was that like? Everyone knows that kind of team, but what was it like being part of that going into training? You mentioned banter around the squad. That must have been at the highest level. If there's anywhere that taught me about banter, it was the crazy game. And it was the highest level. There wasn't a day that you went into training and something didn't happen, whether that be Vaseline in your pocket, whether you got deep heat on your boxer shorts, socks cut, something. There wasn't a day. It was every day something was going on. That was normal. It was just normal to us. You know? And it was, a, I could remember sometimes, because obviously back then you had under 17s, under 19s. And what happened was, is I was two years below a lot of the players that went into the first team and we went MK, MK done. So we was a close knit anyway. So it was, it was crazy. It was brilliant. But times I look back at some of the players and people I've played with, just for terms of banter and stuff like that, the characters was brilliant. brilliant. If you have to name a couple, who, were you like, who was up there for you? Well, the, the best for me that I played at that level was Lionel Morgan, but it was unlucky that Lionel got injured. He played, I think it was 17 Tottenham bid for him, got a knee injury. They come back in for him even though they got the knee injury. And he just never come back. He got three knee injuries. It was sad to see, really, you know, because me growing up, I sort of looked up to him for inspiration, training around the first team and being around him. But probably the longest, most serving players that I played with at Wimbledon that played for a long time would be Joby McEnough, obviously Mikel Ledgerwood uh, and Nigel Ria Coco. They were the... The what, Patrick Adjiman as well, actually saying that, sorry. They played long, long careers within Premier League and Championship, you know. And in terms of off the field, what was the worst thing that happened to you at training? Funny enough, I'm not going to say it because I think it's true, <laughs> but there was, wasn't many things that happened to me like that. I've had this, the Vaseline in the socks, the deep heat in your boxes, but if I'm honest, I was probably one of the copiousers that was out there doing it every day. <laughs> <laughs> so from there where did you go MK Dons to so so we went to MK Dons I was there 17 18 I left there at 19 left at 19 um, stopped playing football for six months you know that was a testing time and obviously just growing up in wanting to be around your friends which probably you look back as the wrong thing but you got to live and you learn and then I had the trial at Barnet um, I remember Paul Fairclough was the, the manager and um an agent took me there and they had we had two games there was so we had two games so it was four sets of, of 11 well four teams first game played I played the first game which is only supposed to play one and he said well, look I want you to play in the second game which is the same day I said okay played in that and then out of all those boys I was the only player that got taken back for the next day for training sort of went there and obviously I had a bit of a reputation for, for things that happened at MK Dons you know, that was my own thoughts and stuff like that. Just a bit of attitude and that. And then he, I remember he signed me and he said to me, look, I'm going to sign you. He said, but I'm only going to give you £100 a week. I lived in South London that time. I said, all right, I'll take it. No problem. Took it, done really well. Um, first six games or something like that, I think. Because it was a month-to-month -month contract. Done well. After the first month, he said, look, I'm going to give you another contract on £200 a week. I said, no problem. So then he offered me another contract about a month later and said look I want you to sign for the season for the year he said but I'm only giving you two, 200 I said look since the day I've come here you've spoken about my attitude in the past and stuff like that I've done everything by the book I've been brilliant I've took you £100 a week travelling from South London and back it's costing me more than you're actually giving me it's the same one the 200 I said I've done that I said I think you need to give me like he said I wanted about 300 off 320 something like that and he said, no, no, no. So we travelled to Accurate and Stanley away, and I'll never forget. And this is, this is the, the side of football people never see. 
travelled to Akita and Stanley in a way. And obviously, I was due to start. I was playing well. There was no reason he wasn't going to start me. Go to Africa and Stanley, travelled up there. He says, "Right, well, you're not going to, you're not going to be on the pit, on the bench. Why? Um, you need to sign the contract." So I said, "Okay." I said, "That we're playing that game now." So I spoke to him again. I said, "Look, you need give me three hundred and I'll sign it." So he gave me three hundred. I signed up for the year and sort of never really looked back. You know, played a lot of games there, scored a few goals in that season. Um, and the next season, scored goals. And then I left. So I'd done two seasons at Barnet, left there and went to Plymouth. Which at the time I knew was, being a London boy, I knew it wasn't the right decision, but it was championship. So I had to yeah. do it. Took it. It was a difficult time under Fairclough. Um, I mean, not Fairclough, it was Paul Sturrock. He was like, oh, I've got to change the way I play and stuff like that. And it just didn't work out. To be honest, that does to be an end of it. it. Didn't work. I left there and went back to MK Dons. So Plymouth was good to realise what it's like to live somewhere else and stuff like that. But in terms of the footballing, it just didn't work out for me there. So it was difficult. Yeah, yeah. And then I suppose if we fast forward, you at Southampton. Yeah. And was that from Blackpool? No. So back to this is where people don't understand. So I went to Southampton, um, and that was a. That's the best football club I've been at, just in terms of size, stature, infrastructure. Uh, just it's a massive football club. Um, and I went there and started on fire. We've done well. Massive. We've got big players in the team. In League One, we had Ricky Lambert, the liner, Snyderlin. We had, who else did we have in Jose Fonte? That was in League One. Wow. Um, and then Atkins coming after Padre coming. Atkins said, look, you can, I'm going to let you go on loan. Um, you, go, you can go and loan with a view to permanent. So I was like, yeah. So, all right. so that went to Mill, which obviously Palace fans are not happy about, but that that's, can't change what happened in the past. Well, that, that in turn got your move to Palace, though, didn't it? Um, down the line, it did. <laughs> I was so. This is the funny story that no one knows. Dougie Freeman was the Dougie. No, was it? No, it wasn't Dougie Freeman. It was George Burley was the manager at the time. And we played, before I went to Millwall, my agent phoned Crystal Palace and said, do you want him? George Birdie said, no, he's not good enough. So I went to Millwall. Obviously, we wind up, end up playing Palace in my last game. I scored a hat-trick. I see George Birdie as I'm walking off. I walk down, I wink at him and carry on walking. Left it as that. Um, but going back to, obviously, the Southampton, so I've done really well Millwall. So when I come back, I was like, obviously, now I've done well. I want to leave now because like you've said I can leave didn't really want to leave Southampton but you've kind of I was the type of player that when I played I always wanted to play football I didn't think about I'll sit there bide your time when you get a bit older maybe you, I did that you know if you're not yeah. playing you bide your time when I was young I just wanted to play football I didn't care where it was what level I just wanted to play football because I feel always every time you're in the shop window you can always keep proving more and more people in the football world wrong or right however you want to put it and Atkins was like okay okay and then obviously Cortez was like Basically, he said, look, the manager doesn't sell the players we want you to stay. I was like, no, I want to leave. And looking back at that, I could have changed it and been like, no, stay. I was like, the manager said I can leave. It was his words. Basically, he doesn't want me there. Now I've gone and done well somewhere. You want me back. It, it doesn't make sense. So I ended up going to Blackpool on loan, which was the Premier League. And obviously, he couldn't turn down that chance. No. Um, and I, it was funny because Pards would be at Newcastle at that time as well. But it just obviously being Newcastle, we couldn't be seen. I'm going to get Jason Puncher from League One, the window when they sold Andy Carroll. So yeah. like, it couldn't be couldn't be seen going to get Jason Puncher. And we've just sold Andy Carroll. It's going to look crazy. <laughs> He's like, look, I want you. And it got to sort of like eight eight o'clock, and I was like, look, I need to go. I'm going Blackpool. So I went there, and that was the best thing ever. Ian Holloway, love him to pieces. Character took me there. I think we had we had 17, 16 or seventeen games left. I think I played. In, made 13 appearances in the wow. Premier League first time scored three or four goals I think and to do that was massive for me massive I had to do it yeah I was going to say what was that like playing that was the first taste of the Premier everything you dreamed of I can imagine yeah everything it was difficult when you first get into it because you're like the pace of this game is quick you don't realise that once you get up to speed you realise right I can play at this level at Southampton, you, did you play under Poch as well? 
Yeah, so what happened was, let's fast forward after Blackpool, that was the season Southampton went into the Championship. And then me and Cortese spoke, the club spoke, the players said, look, we want, obviously, what was good for me is at Southampton, we had a, it was very close to the players and a lot of them are still friends I speak to now. And the players was like, look, we want punch back. And when players do that for you, or to say that to a manager or to whoever chairman, that shows you the credibility in anything. And I think that triggered some things. We had a meeting, I said, look, I'll come back, no problem. And to be fair, I came back and I came back with a different attitude and mentality. Because I was probably a bit upset, annoyed that I didn't, that the way that Atkin said, look, I want, I, you can leave and stuff. And I thought, you know what? Go back, support the boys, done that. And it was brilliant. I didn't play all the time. That was the worst thing. I think probably from those six months, I think, till the, we got promoted. I think I started four games at best. Yeah. If that. But I came on here and there. And it was just brilliant. It was just like brilliant to sit there and watch like, players helping them. You're training all the time. And obviously you're being a leader in the dressing room. With wishing everyone good luck and stuff like that. And it's, it's brilliant. And it's just to get to the Premier League was what everybody wanted. And that was achieved. And then obviously I knew going into the next season it would be a different season because you're starting that pre-season, everyone starts from scratch. So then obviously start pre-season. And Southampton, we always knew we had a good team going into the Premier League. Obviously everyone worries about it and stuff like that. We started off generally quite, quite okay. To be fair to the, the football club, they wanted to push and say we want to finish in the top 10. And I thought that was, at the time, you look back and think, wow, it's crazy. But when you look at it now, you think, you know what, it's good intent. It's pushing the players. Yeah. And they'll see Atkins got the sack and then Poch came. And that was where you saw everyone go up another level. And that was brilliant. Just from day one, you just look at somebody, see his ways, his aura, mannerism. Like very stern. If you cross him one way, that's it. Like, there's no turning back. But yeah. just his ways was brilliant. It was second to none. He's like famous for having one of his players to be as fit as possible. Was it, Did you feel that was a training crazy to go up a lot, like fitness-wise as well? You need two hearts. <laughs> two sets. You need two sets of lungs. And you probably need 10 hours sleep every night. Wow. Every, it's intense. But do you know what? You do for the benefits of it, of the way he wants to play when you get it. Brilliant. That pre-season. And do you know what it is with him? Okay, there was, I remember these Gakon runs we used to do, which when you look back at it, they're not hard, but you used to do them in pre-season probably, I think, three or four times a week. And mentally, it took it, it was more mentally draining than it was hard. But then like his sessions, that was the only running session you'd done. There was never no long distance running. His sessions was all with the ball. Or you use sort of like Verti, Max Kaiser and stuff like that. So it was never really going like, he was doing gym, but he was doing gym with a purpose to what you would do on a pitch. Yeah. And that was where he was, that's where I think he was two steps ahead of everyone. So what was that run you said you have to, what did you have to do in that run? It was just a gap on running. You, you run up to 40, it's 45 seconds. I forgot how many metres it is. It's 45 seconds. Then the metres go up and up and up and then it goes down. Oh, Okay. But it's good though because it's a good laugh because you, everyone can do it. There's not a person that shouldn't be able to do it. Like you could do it. But yeah. it, it's just like you're running groups. There might be groups of sixes or seven. And it's just like you're running around and everyone's like, say, Gakons again, Gakons <laughs> again. But you still do it. You do it and it's a good laugh. It's, it's good. And then, for, like, I suppose that season coming up and the players wanting you back, is that when you realised you were like, probably, you probably knew you were a big character in the dressing room? Is that when you knew you could be a captain? Um, I didn't think then, because you're still growing as a person. I didn't think then, but I do think Southampton taught me massive things that I took to, to Palace, and it took me time to settle in at Palace. That I took to Palace with my character, and that obviously my character evolved there as well as a footballer, as a, as a leader. And that's why I think it was it was it was just brilliant because Southampton, when you look at Lallana has been a captain, Fonte has been a captain, Kelvin Davis was a captain. Obviously, you have people like Ricky Lambert that was in the team at the time. Uh, who else was there? Snyderlin. You had big characters that people didn't realise were big characters. And that, that was brilliant for me. And then, I suppose, moving on to Palace, would you say that's where you enjoyed your, your highlight of your career so far? Yeah, it's, it's hard to say I didn't because it's, it, it's like you're going to your hometown club 
Palace. So got, Palace was always, like I said before, the Mill thing was supposed to happen. There's a few times it was supposed to happen. And then to go back to your hometown club was, I had to take that chance. And the way that it worked out, you never think it's going to work out that way. You know, you don't know in football. You all have a dream and think, oh, yeah, you could do this, do that. But to, the way it worked out over those years that I was there, I couldn't have asked for much more apart from winning that the cup final. <laughs> That's the only thing we could have asked for. And then I know we, we touched on it briefly. So that FA Cup, can you like kind of take us through the build up what it meant to you? See, captain, hometown club, and then I suppose the first you didn't get to start. Yeah, it was, it was difficult. I wasn't captain at then, but I was a, obviously a big leader in the dressing room. We had a, we had that team. We still had a lot of men in it, um, characters. You know, we had Danzi, Mele, Damo, obviously myself. Maka was there then. Um, and even Maka, Maka that season he was a character, but he wasn't the character he is now. So he's grown like, to this current date in his character as well. And it was just like, what was difficult? Because the start of the season, we started on fire. I remember that we, we played Stoke. I remember we got to Stoke away and we was fifth. I never forget. Yannick got injured. And people say oh, it was because of Yannick, but I just think the dynamics of the team just changed. Like, and everyone sort of, it's like everyone, sl- not slowed down, but it's like everyone had a loss of form at that time. And then we ended up going on a run that was horrific. I think it's the, the worst in the Premier League. I think 21 to 18 games without a win or something like that. Yeah. But in the back we had the FA Cup. And we kept on going round, through round, through round, getting there, getting it. And then it was just like, who do we play? We play Tottenham away. So everyone's thinking, all right, Tottenham away. They're thinking, all right, we need to win. Obviously, we've got no wealth. I was injured. Was Maka injured at that time? I think Maka might have been injured at that time as well. Or I might be. I think Maka might have played in that and then got injured after that. I think Jordan no, Maka was injured. They all started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I Maka was injured for that because we, me and Maka got injured at the same time, I remember, because we used to travel in. And then um, we played Tottenham away and we think we need someone to obviously score. The one person you never thought would score was Martin Kelly. Comes up <laughs> and me and him used to have laugh and jokes because he used to, when I used to play left wing, he used to play left back. And he used to always get the ball from 35 yards, cut in and try and bend it in. And I say to him, Kels, there's going to be one time you score it, but please do it when we're 2 0, 3 0. <laughs> and I used to say, No! And he used to say, Stop shouting at me. We used to have banter. And I remember him getting the ball, and I, I was laughing in my head, thinking, Kels is thinking, oh, I weren't playing. So I called it, I messaged him afterwards, and I just put N O, no. And he just started laughing. And for him to score, that was brilliant because Kels is a great lad as well. That was mad. And then from there, Reading. I played Reading. That's where I remember I just got back, come back from injury. I was on the bench that game, played Reading. Obviously, they said that's a, you know, when people look at it, it's a banana skin game to play that in the quarter final. You know, you're playing it, obviously, as they say, your Premier League team, you're playing against a championship team away. You know, people look at you, you think, ah, oh, they should win, they should win. And you could sense that at the start, it was kind of like that. Then we got into the game and then our quality come through and then Watford semi final, which was a massive game considering the history, you know. And it was a quick start from us, to be fair. Could have been... Uh, um, Yannick scored in the first half. Um, but we could have been up earlier than that, I believe. We could have could have been one up before that. And obviously, you know it's going to be... Semi-finals are never going to be 3 or 4 and It's always going to be difficult. Yeah. And obviously, to win that 2-1 is obviously brilliant. And the FA Cup final. And it, what made it worse is where I knew Pard as a person, I knew... I wasn't playing from the week before because I know how he is with me, me and him. How he, I never told me mm-hmm. until two days before, but I knew because I could sense just little things. Like I knew him probably just as well as he knew me as a person, how he managed, how he was, could see when I weren't going to play, when I was going to play. And I knew, but you, you don't, you can never admit to yourself that that's going to happen. But I knew. So anyway, he tells me on the first day and I just walk, say thank you. I said, well, I'll walk out of his office. That's it because I've got what you've made your decision. There's nothing I'm going to say to you that's going to change. Yeah. Like really, I want to argue with Skimmy Shop off this point. So I just went and sat in Danny's room. That was like, like a half nine. I sat in Danny's room till training on my own. Danny, obviously, me and Danny was close. And then um, me and Damo was close. Damo spoke about it. He's like, he's like you're right. I was like, yeah, it's free. I said, it is what it is. I said, I can't change nothing. He's like, I said, but at the end of the day, I said, I've got. Uh, obviously players to worry about and you've got to think Yannick and Yannick and Wolf at the time they really look, looked up to me they was like my little brothers and I, I just sat there and thought you know what If we, even if I was in a team if there's two boys that's going to sort of 
going to be so pivotal to this game for us, it's going to be them two. If they see me sulking or down, that will affect them. Yeah. So I had to be strong for the group, even though inside you're burning. But I was like, all right. And then I remember we travelled and I remember you're in your room. And obviously, if it's the FA Cup final, but you're not going to play, you can't ever sleep. Next day, I'm just in my room, pacing up and down my room. You just want to get out, get out, get on the coach. And that was the best bit, because I remember we got a picture. I think there's about eight, nine of us at the coach. We used to play cards, all in our suits. You know, and it was a, it was a difficult day. Sad day for everyone as friends, because like my friends are upset I'm not playing. And you've got someone like Maps, he's my friend. He weren't on the bench. It's just like so many, but everyone was still together. And I think that was a, a really good moment for me there in the dressing room there, where everyone, I mean, on the coach, where everyone was there in their suits. And another pivotal moment for me was when we scored. Like people don't really notice it. I don't obviously Wayne didn't, but you got how many people actually ran to that corner was brilliant. And you gotta think there was Baki on the sideline. There was Adibayo on the sideline that was on the bench. They all run down. And to see that and when you look at some of those pictures, is like there are things that people will never know how good it, don't get me wrong, there were some things that was bad, but they're things that people realise how together you was at that time. And that's for me it's priceless when you have that in football. Yeah, those celebrations are, are crazy. I, was, I was, don't know. Can you put into words like when you, when it left your foot? Did you know straight away? When I hit it, I just thought if I hit this, people at football you always think oh, I was thinking this, thinking that, but you don't. You just think of instinct. As this, when the ball went out wide to Wardy, I knew where it was coming. That's one thing I knew because Wardy always does that. And I thought, right, if I stay on side and run it, I'm running off the back. I've took the corner, so no one's going to see me. I knew that's where it's going. And all I thought is just get under control and hit the target. I didn't even, like, Danzi, like, when you look at it, if I miss the target, I don't score. Danzi's there for a square, but I didn't even look at him. I didn't look. All I was looking at is the ball the whole way and just hit the target. And I didn't know I scored until I, until I hit it. And then you see, like, I hit it, kept my head down, and then you see the ball bounce out the net. And I was like, whoa. And then that was it. Really. And then obviously you just like you. Yeah. To be honest, Wembley for me at the time was because I come on all the adrenaline, not playing. Didn't really feel like I was in a football match until extra time, because everything was just adrenaline. It was like fouls. Everything was going quick, and you're like, do you know what I mean? Yeah. Uh, what were you saying in your celebration? Ah, I was upset with Pards. He knows that. We spoke about it. You know, I was upset with him. But when I look back at it, it was a good move as a manager because he knows my character. So like I was saying, where he knows me well and I know him well, he knows my character. He knows, I don't know, if some players he might drop and they'll sulk and then put them on and they bring that sulkiness onto the pitch. He knew I was a fighter. So he knew he could drop me and knew I'll be there. All right, I'll show you. And he could take that burden of rap. Do you know what punches proved me wrong? Like that, That's how... My character is, is never give up on fight. So it was, a, it was, it was a good move. It's just a shame we didn't win. You look back at it, and there's so many things. You look back at it and think, flip me, I should have, I should have kicked. I know it sounds crazy. Should have kicked Rooney up in the air. Yeah. I didn't. Then there's other players along the way that could have kicked him on. It was a bit, and it was weird for our team character, of the way we used to when we went ahead, we'd hold on to leads. That that happened in a final. You know, I do think the ref killed us. Kattenberg, ridiculous. Uh, for me, a disgrace personally. Um, so you look back at things and to, to see boys later and say, oh, I'm sorry, I got that wrong. We should have had a red card or a goal in the first minute. Our first five, ten minutes would have been a completely, maybe been a completely different game. You know, Rooney should have seen red. It was on the yellow card from 65 minutes. Made how many tackles just kept on leaving and leaving and leaving. But that's football for you. You can't change it. Uh, you know, you can only look back at it and I'm hoping that in my lifetime I get to see Crystal Palace win their FA Cup. That would be class, wouldn't it? Yeah, definitely. That's one thing I'd love for sure. I was there when, you're, when you got to say bye to the fans and everything. Obviously, a, an emotional day. Like, yeah. What was that? Now you've had a chance to like, reflect on it. What was that like? That oh, was a fantastic day. To Obviously, those things stay with you forever. To be at a football club where... You've not been there like a Spironi, Spironi for 10 years. Obviously, and the people to think of you in that way and to say to you they want you to come back is they're special for you. For me, I'm never going to be one that says, oh, I was the best at this, I was the best at that. The people always decide that. 
And for me, that day, that showed that the people decided that and that was their, their choice. And that was brilliant. You know, I want to say a special thank you to Steve, Steve Parrish for that because he was obviously the guy that pushed for that, obviously. And you got Mark Bright as well, which was fantastic. Deserved it, like well, everything you did for the club. So Yeah, it was sad. It was a sad day to leave the way that I did, to be honest. Um, you know, upsetting, but you can't change it. You know, if I look back at things and say, if you look, if if you look back at things in your life, say, could you change this? Could you change that? Of course, I would have wanted to change the last two years at the football club. I can't help that you weren't given a chance, and you just got to get on with it. Uplifting pathos. Like we was chatting just before this. Like important having your family there and being settled. You you feel different in your career. How would you kind of explain that? Yeah, I feel different. I feel like I'm a different age because I know that you're coming to the end of the road. Yeah, that's the that's the realisticness of it. You're coming to the end of the road. Obviously, you've got your children, your family. Um, but I probably am different in the way I. You know, you, you're not. You're you're hidden from all the glitz and glamour here. You know, you, you're not. There's not massive amounts of cameras every week. There's not massive amounts of people stopping you in the street all the time. It's completely different, and I think that that's been a good thing for me to maybe adapt to when you're getting ready for that retirement of football. I think that's it's been brilliant for me in that sense. It's just obviously just sitting there waiting, wanting the football cup to pick up, and hopefully try and get yourself in Europe next year. Punch, that's that's class. I can't really ask any more for me. Thank you very much for chatting to me. So always love chatting to you. Always got good stories. It's been a pleasure, my man, Danny. <laughs> 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 oh, damn. Brilliant, man.